Hi folks, Alan here from Precision Waterjet We Build Those Airbag Trailers. I will give you a, a long video today that explains a lot of the detail in the trailer that some of you have been asking about. So uh, I'm going to walk around the trailer and take a video of every uh, of the small components we haven't talked about in the past and how this trailer has slight variations compared to the drawings and the original plans. Now, uh, there has been some confusion about the plans and who owns the trailer and the drawings, etc. Uh, we never drew this trailer up. We're builders and constructors. The trailer plans come from a company in Australia called Fab Plans. We've partnered with them, and each time we build a trailer for a client, or if you want to uh, join our trailer building course, you have to go to Fab Plans and purchase a set of their plans. It's about $100 US. So, uh, we purchase a set of plans, we build you a trailer, you own the rights to the trailer, you own all of that stuff. Okay, so here's a bit of a view of the trailer that uh, it, it, I'll go in much more detail than I have in the past. Let's be clear that if I'm answering all the questions we've seen on the um, YouTube channel. So the first thing is we do have a spare wheel and tyre. If you have a problem, uh, you can change that and uh, around this video I'm going to show you how it's changed without the need to have a jack. Obviously you'll need um, some tools but you don't need a jack to actually change a flat tire. We'll start with the front here. Um, we've had quite a bit of comment about chains in New Zealand and in a few other countries. A trailer under a certain weight and your weights will vary by country and regulation. They require one or two chains. We for this trailer under 2000 kgs only require one chain and it can be connected in this manner. If you do require two chains you simply install or you install two chains here and they must be crossed over when they go on to the tow hitch. So um, if you've seen our previous videos and the chains look like they're incorrect or just dropped over the tow ball, that's uh, just us towing around the yard or something. We obviously wouldn't go down the road like that. Uh, this is a product we buy. It's a multi-fit 1 and 7 8 or 50 mil, uh, 2,500 kg uh, tow hitch. Uh, very easy to install. It's self-adjusting if you've got different tie, type, uh, size tow hitches. And again, you can buy those pretty much anywhere around the planet. Uh, we've got two cables running out of the trailer. Uh, here you can see here that it's a larger volume of pins in the plug. The standard plug is your trailer fittings only. And under here we've got electrical connections so that we can charge the battery from the car. Now if you are going to charge your battery from the car, you can't just plug it into the charging circuit. Or else what will happen is the trailer battery could be low and when your car is switched off it could be dragging the car battery down to charge itself. So you need an installer to install a proper uh, circuit um, and they're made specifically to handle this issue so that when the car has enough battery power it will charge the battery on the trailer and uh, I'll plug that in in a minute. Okay um, pretty easy to um, understand what's going on here, just need a wheel jack, but we have been asked could you install an air jack? Well of course you can, uh, we haven't on this occasion, but you could pop one in there somewhere and you've got air available, so that shouldn't be a real issue. This tank in the front is made by a New Zealand company called Roadrunner and uh, it's been uh, tested for quality and air pressure, so it's a certified air tank and it runs at 11 bar. Uh, we run at a pressure much lower than that, so it's the price for our needs. It's aluminium, um, it's a few hundred dollars. You can buy them anywhere in the world. Uh, we buy this one because we want to support local. So it's 25 kgs, and the compressor puts air into the bottom of the tank here. There's a tank valve, which you must remember to turn on occasionally and get the moisture out. You don't want moisture uh, condensing in there as it does on compressed air conditions. and accumulating around the air system. The air comes out here uh, when we turn the valves on. I'll give you a look at the valves. Underneath this cover there is a compressor. I'll go into more detail of that uh, in a later video. It's a compressor we buy specifically for uh, this. It's a 100% duty cycle and it pumps up to about 180 psi. We've got a gauge here and you can see that that's sitting at just under 150. 140 psi and that's the system pressure that we operate under. So the bags can't get more pressure than we output and that's about 150 psi. Um, however the bags are rated to many times that so we're unlikely to burst a bag through pressure alone. Uh, the air comes out of our 
oh, while we're talking about that, have a look at our fittings. They're high pressure stainless steel. So while we're here, let's have a look at the fittings. Uh, we've gone away from the plastic fittings and all the other fittings that you can buy for cars and automotive applications and gone to these industrial fittings. They're a thousand PSI burst, so they're not going to break on us. They're crimped and they're stainless steel and uh, very high quality. So if we ever have a leak, it's generally going to be in this area where we haven't done something properly or there's got a, got a bit of grit. Once these things are done up tight, that's it. They ain't going to leak. Um, there's never been a, a leak that we can't see locally by spraying a bit of that uh, leak test on or putting a bit of soapy water on. And you can fix it very quickly. So air in from the compressor, air out from the tank. That line comes up underneath this manifold and goes into the bottom of these two air valves. These air valves are operated either manually or via a remote control switch that we've also installed. You can operate the switch or you can operate manually. Um, when we have one set of valves for the left side of the trailer and one set of valves for the right side. And what that does, it enables us to set the trailer at an angle if you should have an uneven load. For example, you might be loading logs or something one day and you've got a whole lot of logs on one side of the trailer, you might need more air in that side just to hold it up. So running two separate air lines down each side of the trailer allows us to do that. I'll show you how that works. If I pop these two, I can use the remote control, but I can do this manually. If I pop, push these two buttons, you'll see the trailer go down. Pretty easy. And these two buttons will lift the trailer up. Quite quick. That was the compressor starting uh, because it just needed to top itself up with air. So when we're not uh, too close to it, I'll start it up again. Um, remote control, we install that simply because there are people who want to drive their car on the trailer. And while the car's on, they need to be able to open the doors and get out. Now, if the trailer's down, uh, you will see that some of the doors won't clear the guards. I'll put the trailer down again. And if you're in a low car, you can't open the doors. However, if you're sitting in the car by yourself, you probably need this remote control with you because you can hit the up button and the trailer will go up to the height that you desire, higher than road uh, traveling, and you can probably open the door uh, over that height. Right, well, let's have a bit of a further look here. I've got a, a, can, a switch that we just take out of the trailer if we don't want it stolen. If we put the trailer on the ground at night and we take the switch out, it's very unlikely that somebody's going to come along armed with a switch and know how all this works. Plus, the trailer will be on the ground and it's nearly impossible to take away when it's on the ground unless you pump it up. So, of course, they can, you know, a good thief will overcome uh, these things, but um, we do our best to stop them. Um, we have a, uh, a decent battery in there, a boat battery or something like that, that will handle a whole lot of heavy discharges. And all of the um, car wiring comes straight to the battery to charge from that charging circuit. What we've got in this little box is our PCB, our printed circuit board that we designed specifically for this trailer. And the reason we did that is because you can see how many wires are needed. Uh, this is the tail light cluster coming from the back of the trailer. Uh, this here is the uh, electric brakes, because we run an electric brake system on this trailer. Uh, we've got the trailer plug coming from the car. We need power to run the systems, and we have a GPS installed on this trailer. Here it is there. Quite often when it's uh, going out to a customer, we'll put a tag on here and disguise it as a, you know, something else and call it a you know, brake management system. So they won't immediately see that it's a GPS, but we can track this trailer anywhere and everywhere. So um, this circuit board is available from us. We make them. They're made specially for us. Uh, we can sell those to you. They're not very dear. And it allows you to uh, very easily decide where the wires go and very easily do any repairs if, if maintenance is needed, particularly if you run electric brakes. Sometimes that's confusing for people. Um, and all the uh, uh, wiring terminals are marked for the international color code. Uh, as are the electric brakes for the brake company we use, which is an Australian company called Elect Brakes. You can see it marked there. And international wiring standards for the taillights. There's a, um, an RF device here that transmits to the, uh, to the remote control. And these are the relays that run all the circuits inside 
um, the valve controllers here. These two plugs uh, for the valves, one clearly marked down valves, one marked up valves. Since, you, uh, since we've done a few of these, we've made some modifications to this to adapt to various um, handsets, and also we've removed these plugs and replaced them with screw terminals so that over here you can actually screw these valve uh, solenoids on in case you have a failure and it saves unplugging the plug. I, I dreamed that in the early days and didn't really know what I was doing. So, uh, And I'm an old codger, sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. you know. So uh, that's the box and that's what's in there. I'm going to turn it on, it gets a bit noisy, close the lid and get some air into it. So main switch on, compressor on, close the box. This here is the electric braking system. Uh, we prefer to install Electbrakes products and wire it into the electrically controlled uh, drum brakes installed on the front wheels only on this particular trailer. Of course on heavier trailers we may wish to install brakes on all four wheels but for under 2000 kgs the two front wheels are sufficient. Elect brakes wires directly into the brake uh, uh, solenoids down in the wheels and of course it, then it wires into the brake circuit in that printed circuit board that you saw there. Uh, I'll just go around and show you what these brakes look like. So clearly there's a, a drum in here and we chose drum brakes over um, disc brakes. The disc brakes are a bit more expensive but they're not in, they don't really offer any great advantage over drums for this particular trailer. And the wiring for all of the brakes runs along inside the cavity inside the chassis as does all the air products. Each of the trailers we've designed this little corner um, cover so that you can maintain the uh, wiring or the air if you need to. We've never had an occasion to remove it once it's been installed. Now, while I'm up this end of the chassis let's have a look at the construction of the A-frame. We have had some comments and some concerns about having an A-frame that's welded to the front cross member as against going right through the cross member as is traditional in some trailers. Uh, we could of course also put the A-frame underneath the cross member but then we wouldn't lower the trailer uh, as far as we wanted to if we wanted it very flat and we can have uh, questions about that because people are worried about uh, the trailer breaking. They've seen instances of a break around this area. So two things that cause breaks. They're generally nearly always not the weld. The weld probably doesn't break. What happens is as you weld, the weld is very strong and you get this weak or stressed area around the weld and if the material either side is not the correct thickness or not up to the appropriate standard then actually you'll get a tear on this material or this will tear. Now we use four and five mil here so there's no chance of that tearing and there's no chance of the weld breaking if it's properly prepared. <clears throat> In addition to that you'll see that this A-frame has Two extra components running down and also butt welding onto the cross member. So now there's four of these components welded directly to that cross member which are four or five mil steel, really good welds and they have gussets underneath as well. So um, in all the years we've been making these trailers and the loads that are commonly carried on them we have inspected these regularly, we see no cracks in the galvanizing, we see no bending moment when we measure them, they simply don't fail. Um, the other reason that we need to have this uh, A-frame terminate here is that all of these pipes and all of the wiring that come out of the box, they go in the back of the box, they go into this A-frame. And that's where it goes. It goes along here and around the corner. So clearly if we went through um, this cross member, we'd have to cut holes in the A-frame anyway. And that would not actually, uh, there'd be no gain having a big hole there already cut into it. That means we'd have two joins on the uh, cross member rather than the A-frame and to be frank this is more controllable. So the reason we run all of the tubes and all of the wiring uh, in this trailer um, steel here is that we don't have anything under the trailer hanging under. There's no pipes, there's no wiring, nothing to get caught. It's dead flat. So if an occasion arose where you had to <clears throat> pull this off the road and something failed, it'll pull off very quickly and easily without scouring the road and without causing any damage. And I'll get back to that a little bit later. Okay, let's have a look at the deck now. 
A few questions arise about the material. We use um, any material that the customer wants for the deck. This particular product is called Tech 200. It's 17 mil thick uh, composite uh, particle board with a non-slip top and a protected bottom. And we've never had a failure. It uh, Obviously, if you put something really um, bad and heavy and sharp on it, you might scratch it. But we don't have them breaking or cracking, and they don't delaminate, and they're not water damaged. This trailer's out all the time, and several years old. So you can see that this trailer's in very good condition. What we've done here, uh, different from most, is we've added um, a drop box, a holder, onto the chassis underneath. Put a little cover over it. It's got a hole in the bottom so the water drains out, and that's to hold various fittings. In this case, what we've done is built a motorcycle holder and they can drop in there in various places over the trailer and that means this trailer is pretty versatile in terms of carrying loads. You could all, you could make anything to drop in there. It could be some staunchions that go across so that you can side load pallets or anything of that nature. Now we're going to take a close look at the suspension because this concerns a lot of people. So basically uh, the design allows us to solidly weld this suspension component to the chassis. It's got to be carefully aligned. So if you're considering building your own trailer, this is one of the key things you have to think about. Um, the pipe that comes out of the front of the trailer and runs along this um, metal comes out underneath the trailer here. You can see there's a T-piece and it breaks and continues along to the front wheel. Um, that comes up through that T-piece and into the back of the airbag here. Again, high quality tube fittings are essential. Airbag, a lot of questions about the airbag. Now, these airbags, uh, people are saying the airbag won't continue to uh, sustain all these weird movements and this unusual shape and that they're meant to be square. Well, actually, that's not uh, entirely correct uh, from a mechanical design viewpoint. This is rubber, it's very flexible, it's very strong, it's designed to be flexible and inside we've only got air. These are very high quality airbags. You can buy the dearest airbag on the planet or the cheapest. And generally speaking, they're gonna do the job. Now, this airbag here is um, blowing up about as high as we take it, but we can take it higher than this. And you can see that the airbag doesn't rub on anything and it's not overstretched. And these airbags have been out in the sun for a long, long time. And you can see there's no apparent damage, no um, loss of uh, strength. They have never failed us, and we don't have any problems installed in this manner. Now, it is true to say that if someone came along with a knife or something and stabbed it, you're going to go flat. Well, gee, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and that's the same if they stab a tyre or anything else on any trailer. So, you know, don't let that very, very... We've never heard of it happening. Uh, occurrence stop you considering airbags for your trailer. Uh, we have a little light installed here because uh, the regulation people have asked us to have a light on the outs to... Uh, external side of the trailer, some LEDs that we get from AliExpress or somewhere in China. And here's the pivot point for the rear suspension. So everything happens here, and we've got a large bar through there that's got a bearing in each end, and that sits on this axle. Um, all of this here has to be very carefully aligned because it sets up uh, the alignment and the caster and camber of the wheel. And of course, uh, then there's the mounting of the mudguard. Now, there's been some criticism of mudguards that they'll break, and yes, they have broken in the past. Uh, what we've done is found a way of installing some quite heavy 4 mil steel here, right down to the top of that swing arm, and on the top we've got this uh, 3 mil um, propeller plate, and it's installed with huck bolts. These are huck bolts, not rivets, and they're extremely strong, very industrial, and uh, they certainly hold um, this propeller plate product on there. You can see how strong it is. I can really push on it and jump it around. Nothing happens. Now, you've got exactly the same going on for the leading wheel. So we call this the trailing wheel because clearly the swing arm trails. And this is the leading trail, even though it's at the back. Sounds odd, I know, but that's the way we do it. Uh, again, your air pipes and wiring come out through the chassis there and go into the back of the airbag. On the back here, we've got the lights. We get some a lot of questions about the lights, that they're in the wrong place. Well, for some countries, they may in fact be in the wrong place. But for New Zealand, uh, this trailer is 
fully certified, it's registered, and it has what we call a warrant of fitness. And uh, certainly, um, we uh, get a warrant of fitness on each occasion because these lights can be seen uh, in the daytime and at night from uh, the regulation distance behind the trailer, and you can see the braking and the indicators and the stoplights very easily. We go and plaster a few uh, reflectors all over the trailer. Now, you could put the tail lights here, of course, we could even put them back here, it's up to you. They can be welded onto some sort of stanchion. We simply put them there because a lot of our trailers are built for farmers and people with equipment, and back here, with wide loads, they can get knocked off fairly easily and broken, and they do. But in here, as you can see, they're very well protected and nothing's going to get at them. But if your country requires uh, your lights to be at the back, we just put them there, or you put them there. Absolutely no problem. On the back here, you can see we've used a steel tread plate for the loading ramp. Now, the loading ramp does not go up or down. It stays there. It's designed to be that way. And we've had criticisms that it's dangerous and it's sharp and someone will kill themselves or hurt themselves on the corner. Look, to be frank, if you're going to walk into that with your shins, you probably shouldn't be allowed out by yourself. And if you're in a vehicle and traveling that close to this trailer that you're likely to run into it, um, then again, you probably shouldn't be driving on the road. If you are really concerned about it, you put something here that's got some big reflectors on it. It's just welding. You can do that. Number plate, that's a good place for us to put it because we've put the lights up there. But again, if you put the lights back here, the number plate can be run sideways in most countries, or you can flip it out of the way. Shock absorbers. Now, um, before people have viewed all the trailers, they've jumped back at us and said, hey, this is a pretty poor design. There's no shock absorbers, and the trailer will jump up and down on the road. Well, the, all the trailers have had shock absorbers installed. Uh, the designers have done a great job of working out how they uh, operate, what the leverages are, and what they should be. These are Alco shock absorbers. They handle two ton each, and they're securely mounted where they need to be, uh, and they do a good job. So there's four shock absorbers on the trailer, and as you can see, they do what they're meant to do. They absorb shock. Now, when the trailer's empty and no load is on it, it will move fairly freely. I'm just pushing it with my foot, and you can see it can go up and down there. However, when it's traveling along the road, it travels very smoothly. It doesn't jump up and down. It just sits there and the suspension does what you'd expect it to do. And later date, we'll try and do a video of one going down the road, both empty and full. When you put a load on the trailer, uh, say it's a thousand kilos, then you put the right amount of air in the bags with the controller and it lifts the trailer up to ride height, which is about where it is now. And obviously the load pushing down equalizes the air pushing up. So the trailer stays level. It doesn't bounce up and down the road. It's very, very smooth. And same with cornering. It just stays level because the airbags are designed to help carry loads in a smooth way. So for all you um, people who have said there's no shock absorbers, um, you were slightly wrong. As you can see, the shock absorbers here and you could install the, the appropriate weight for your vehicle, but we generally recommend these. You'll see um, stainless steel fittings in most places, simply because they look better, they seem to last longer, and we can put some um, Loctite on them and they grip into the um, chassis where we've put a threaded component rather than a fixed nut so they can come in and out easily if you have to do repairs. I think that's it, folks. Oh, uh, tie downs. We got criticised for not having enough tie downs. I don't know why whoever it was said that, um, thought there wasn't enough tie downs. There's more tie down places and actual tie down points on this trailer than anything I've ever seen. You can put your tie downs in here, you can put them on top in the middle, you can wrap them around everything that you want. If you really want to, you could put some of these things on here and weld them on. So you can put tie downs wherever you want. If you have bought Fab Plans um, trailer build plans and you're constructing your own trailer, you'll see that they generally don't have a strong back on their trailer. This is called a strong back, and it's primarily designed to give more uh, longitudinal support against the possibility of the trailer uh, bending when you have a load on it. Now, the trailer that in their plans is designed uh, appropriately without the need for a strong back. And it tends not to bend. However, we build trailers slightly longer and we also carry much heavier loads, up to three tonne. 
So that facilitated the need for us to install these strong backs, which make it easier for the farmers and the tractor operators to tie their loads on. And it also meant that we just didn't get any flex in those longitudinals that run down the chassis. There's four of them. So that's why we have a strong back. And of course, you're at liberty to install whatever you like. Remember that the plans are just that. They're plans. They're guides. They're telling you how to do the things that you may not know about. But um, you, you have the... Um, you're at liberty to change them in whatever way you want. You can, you know, if something says 600 mil there, whether you make it 700 or 550, it doesn't really matter. It's designed to hold the thing together and carry your loads. Okay, we'll do some fun stuff now. Let's pretend that we have a flat tyre. We have been criticised that if you have a flat tyre, it's very difficult to change tyres and wheels on these trailers because it's likely going to be uh, flat. Uh, the trailer won't be down because the airbag bag is, is still working. Um, but it just means that they've got to somehow undo that and, and jack it up and you can't get a jack under. Well, guess what? Um, God in his wisdom uh, invented trees and from those trees we get these things, a chunk of wood. And you can easily carry that on the front of the trailer or find a rock on the side of the road, anything of that nature. You simply put it under the trailer, then you go through your remote control and, or up to the front of the trailer and you let the air out. We'll go and use it up here so we can show you how that works. Get the air out of the trailer, and you can see the trailer is down. You can let one side down or both sides. I've let all the air out, and now the trailer at the back will be sitting on that piece of wood. But all the air has gone out of the bag, which means that you can lift this up, can't you? So, what we can do is there you go. I've lifted that wheel off the ground by hand. I've put a little bit of wood under it. And as you can see now, it's pretty easy uh, to take to this thing with a spanner, take the wheel off, put the new tire on there. We've removed that piece of wood, drop that tire down again. So it's sitting on the ground. There's still no air in the bag. And the trailer's sitting on the wood. We'll just go back up the front and we'll, in fact, we'll just use the remote control here, press button 2, and you can see the trailer's lifted itself up, which it's meant to do. We move our, our tree jack, put them back in a safe place, and guess what? We just changed the wheel of the airbag trailer, and we didn't have a jack on us. Of course, you have to remember to make sure that you've got appropriate spanners. Now, that works equally well for the front wheel as well as the back wheel. You still put the piece of wood under the front. You can still lift those wheels up and clock them up. If you don't have another piece of wood to chock that wheel up, you can undo it, lift it by hand, change the tyres. Very easy. So that's a neat trick and has saved a few people. Hi, folks. I want to thank you for persevering through the reasonably long video we just had uh, describing the trailers in detail. So what I want to do is make sure that you're aware we're looking to publish a course in the next few weeks. It's going to be an eight week long uh, tutorial on how to build one of those trailers. So we'll be working with the designers, Fab Plans, who are the Australian company that own the plans and put the effort into designing the trailer other than the bits that we modify when we build a trailer for a specific customer application. Uh, sometimes we modify the, um, the box up there and we modify the front hitch. We do a little bit of work around the, um, uh, the strong back on the trailer uh, to avoid any bending if we do particularly long trailers or heavy loads. But principally we use the fab plans layout and build to their specifications. So what we're going to teach you in our course is how to build one of these trailers. You may be a DIY um, home builder, you may be uh, an expert fabricator, but it's always good to pick up some tricks from someone who's done quite a few of these. Um, we'll teach you how to cut and handle the steel, how to weld sequence the uh, welding up of the main frame so that there's no bends, uh, bends in it, and also the weld sequencing on all the small parts because they are inclined to get um, heat distortion. Then we'll show you how to put it all together with the wiring 
and more particularly the air system and the airbags and where to source those parts from and then how to just make sure that everything's aligned properly particularly your wheels front and rear uh, and that the brakes work and function as they should so that's a course that's coming up soon you need to if you haven't already please go and subscribe when you subscribe it actually helps us by telling us how many people are actually interested in what we're doing if we don't get any subscribers well i don't know why i'm here really i could go fishing couldn't i or trailering or something so if you subscribe and then push on the little bell that will alert you to the next time we release a video and and the next video should be talking about the course and there'll be probably three or four parts to the course. It'll be an eight week course. So over that eight weeks, we'll do um, certain uh, programmed sequence building of the trailer. And there'll be a number of opportunities in the course to purchase some things off us. You may purchase just the course. There'll be a small cost to it because it takes us time and effort to share all of our valued information. And the uh, next tier of the course um, in terms of uh, value for you is that we'll offer the course plus maybe the electrical system in its complete form. So all the lights, all the wiring, the PCB that we make, you would have seen in there, that controls the battery management, the airbag valves, it controls the braking system and things of that nature. It makes wiring up really easy. Uh, the next tier might be to purchase the build plans, the fabrication process from us, the electrical, and then also the air system. So we'll include the, the airbags, we'll include all of the um, work that we've done on the tubing and the plumbing, all the fittings for the airbags, the compressor, uh, the tank that's up in the front there that's been specially designed for us to make this all work properly. You can buy all of that. And the next tier may well be um, the pre-cut and drilled um, complex components around all the suspension here so that you don't have to do that or find a, um, a, a water jet company or a laser company. We can do that in flat packet and send it to you with clear instructions and all you have to do is sort of mount it on your bench and weld away like a, a madman or a mad woman for that matter. So uh, that's going to save you a lot of work. Now, there's no point in us sending the the large components for your trailer. You can buy wheels wherever you are. You can buy a battery. You can buy those long bits of steel and the decking, whatever you decide to put on there, whether it be steel or core 10 or perhaps plywood. Uh, so the, the big bits you can buy. But the, the smaller things that are really a pain in the butt if you don't know where to get them from, that's what we'll provide you with. So please um, push the buttons for the little bell. Make sure you subscribe so we can notify you and know how many people are actually interested. And then keep an eye out for the next video, which is going to show you how to build a trailer in your garage, if you're allowed to, of course, once you've mowed the lawn and all that other stuff. Thank you.